Hello, everybody. So today I wanted to read an article from Kyle at iFixit. It says here, Apple emails reveal internal debate on right to repair. Tim Cook didn't reveal anything new during his testimony before the House Judiciary Committee Wednesday, but emails his company shared with the committee spoke volumes. These internal discussions reveal what looks like Apple's united front against right to repair is really an internal debate rife with uncertainty. It says, what is our repair strategy? Do we believe it's important to get ahead of any additional regulations about repair options in Europe or right to repair legislation in the U.S.? Are we comfortable releasing our repair manuals for all products moving forward? Do we want to promote the genuine parts repair program as part of our ongoing effort to give our customers more choices? How should our public position on right to repair change to take into account updates we are making? Should we connect the dots or try to keep everything separate? And I think these are all... These are all good questions. The New York Times editorial in favor of right to repair last April set off a fire alarm inside Apple's public relations team when person whose name I can't pronounce reached out to research the issue. Apple's VP of communication said in an internal email that, quote, we should get him on the phone with Apple VP Greg, Jaws, or Phil. That spawned an instant debate. The larger issue is that our strategy around all of this is unclear. Right now, we're talking out of both sides of our mouth and no one is clear where we're headed. The emails show the high profile of right to repair inside Apple as leaders debate how to respond to a request for comment on an upcoming column. The piece is using Senator Warren's new right to repair agriculture to talk about the broader right to repair effort and plans to use Apple as a symbol in that fight. We're meeting with everybody, everyone shortly about the overall strategy and then I'll connect with Greg. The email goes on. Applebaum has, of course, talked with iFixit and others. They're right about that. This kind of goes back when they, you say that there is some sort of internal strife within the company. This actually goes back to a video that I did about two and a half years ago, and it's exactly what it is that I intended to do. We, over here, this old video that I did says, right to repair is 99% inspiration and 1% legislation. The real right to repair is not going to be the legislation. The real right to repair is going to be getting hundreds of thousands of people interested in right to repair, hundreds of thousands of people to realize how it adds to their bottom line, how it's fun to take something that was dead and use open-ended troubleshooting and diagnostic skills as to solve the puzzle, save yourself money, or Save someone else money while making some money for yourself while you're at it. And that once I've gotten enough people to realize how fun it is and also how you can make money at it, when they get to positions within these companies, they're not going to want to take part in anti-repair activities, nor are they going to want to implement anti-repair policies. My entire goal over the past seven to eight years has been to hopefully at some point get to a point where the people that work at these businesses actually realize what's going on and think to themselves, no, I'm not having that. I'm not going to be a part of a business that does this. And it's not even going to be ex us forcing them to change. It's going to be them changing from the inside. And that appears to be part of what is going on here. It says, the email show the high profile of, I read that part already. The conversation resulted in a set of talking points that Kyan Drance, VP of Marketing, talked through with Applebaum. Afterwards, Apple PR wrote, Cayenne did a great job and emphasized the need for a thoughtful approach to repair policy because of how important it is to balance customer safety with access to more convenient repairs. This is just... I, I can't stand this. because In order to have this whole idea that... That, that, like By making this information available, you're hurting customer safety. What you're doing is you're assuming that if the manual doesn't exist, that the customer is not going to open it. That they're, Because you didn't release a manual or parts, that, that just means that they're never going to open their phone. That they don't have any curiosity whatsoever, and that they're just going to tolerate the fact that the device is unfixable. Which is hysterical, that that's not the case at all. But if we continue, Apple was less convincing than they hoped. The editorial, carrying the weight of the Times' entire editorial board, came out forcefully in favor of right to repair. Of Apple specifically, the Times remarked, the company is welcome to persuade people to patronize its own repair facilities or to buy new iPhones, but there ought to be a law against forcing the issue. The saga of two PDFs. Score one for the Rebel Alliance, but that's not the end of this saga. 
Rewind one month, and I fix it had unwittingly triggered another flurry of internal emails unearthed by the Judiciary Committee. Last, mu- last March, we discovered complete service manuals for the newest 2019 IMAX up on Apple support site. Both manuals are still there. Take a look. This was such a dramatic departure for Apple that we were curious whether it was intentional. iFixit writer Whitson Gordon dropped Apple a friendly line asking what their plan was. While on Apple's website today, I noticed something different. This page now has links to repair guides for two iMac models, the 21-inch and the 27-inch, showing how to disassemble and reassemble these two machines in quite specific detail. Is this a mistake, or did you mean for this to be online? If the latter, does Apple have any comment on why they've decided to share this information, which as far as I know has not been available to the public before? And should we expect more repair guides on other products to become available soon? Thanks for any help you can provide. Witness and Gordon. Apple didn't reply to Whitson's request. They did look up his credentials and launched a wide-ranging internal debate. The manual stayed online. We were left to wonder if Apple was turning a new leaf and moving in a more consumer-friendly direction. Apple service manuals for both the 21.5-inch 4K model and 27-inch 5K iMac are well-written and extensive by manufacturer standards. Each features over 100 pages of tutorials for replacing parts like fans, speakers, memory, hard drives, and the logic board. They even list the tools that you need to get the job done. Alas, Apple doesn't sell them, but we've got you covered, and they picture the guide. In response to Whitson's email, an internal Apple memo asks, what's our repair strategy? Showing more division inside Apple than anyone knew. Again, this is not this is not news to me for a number of reasons. The first is that I actually got to meet someone that works at Apple, whose name I'm not giving away for obvious reasons, who was more than open to telling me about this kind of stuff that was going on on the inside. And one of the things that he had told me is he was talking to me about posts that he had seen on some sort of, I don't know if it was an internal message board or whatever, memo, something, where it was actually a link to one of my videos included, and someone had said, really, like, is this what we're doing now? Is this why we're doing the things that we're doing? I I don't know exactly what it was referring to. Maybe it was referring to why a certain chip was made exclusive, or maybe it was referred to why something was secretive in the way it was, but it linked to a video that I did that I believe was on the ISL 9240 chip not being available, something like that, and it sparked a conversation. And just knowing that that was going on with an Apple as early as around November or December of last year really was something that kind of made me a little bit excited. It's like finally some people, because here's the thing. I used to believe that the people at the company knew everything that was going on and were okay with it long, you know, back in the day. But then I figured out, no, it's just they don't. They're normal people. They do their job. They don't know what other parts of the department or what other parts of the company are doing. But once they start to recognize what's going on, they're going to have a problem with that. And the fact that my videos may have in any way or I fix its writings or I fix its editorials have in any way contributed to this is absolutely amazing and awesome. Right now, it's pretty clear things are happening inside of a vacuum, and there is not an overall strategy. Plus, with one hand, we are making these changes, and the other is actively fighting right to repair legislation, moving in 20 states without real coordination for how updated policies could be used to leverage our position. An Apple spokesperson writes to a group of PR executives. You have to understand what they're going for here. How updated policies could be used to leverage our position. So what that's going to mean is, hey, look, we released a manual that shows how to take apart the IMAX, so get rid of this right to repair legislation. Yeah, I, like, I know that we have exclusivity agreements with the companies that make the charging chips for our devices. I know we don't release the schematic to the device, which is now needed in order to get the data back because the SSD is soldered to the board. I know that like 90% of the stuff consumers want, we don't give them, but we gave them this manual and we have this shitty IRP program that gives you limited, overpriced, slow access to screens and batteries, so just get rid of this legislation. You see what they're talking about there. They want to be able to to use this as a PR stunt. And you know that because the spokesperson wrote it to a group of PR executives. So this is one of those things where you really have to keep your eye on the ball and not be fooled. And I'm going to get onto that as I read the rest of this article. Apple's intense legislative opposition to right to repair is one of the primary reasons the legislation has not passed yet, despite being introduced in over 20 U.S. states this year. Last year, Apple's lobbyists in the California State House went so far as disassembling a phone for legislatures, telling them the device could catch fire if the customers tried to fix them. And I did a video a while back where I open a phone, I try to get the battery out, I'm trying to get the battery out using the end of a hammer, and I was not able to light the phone on fire, so you, you, you understand what my feelings are there. 
So why did they release the iMac manuals? Apparently to earn points on the green certification standard EPEAT. Good idea. Unfortunately, not everyone at Apple was on board. Here's the story as Apple PR explained it. What is on your shirt sleeve? What is on my shirt sleeve is probably some crap from when I was working on my bike. I'm guessing this is like oil or some shit. I don't know. Why do you care? So why did they release the manuals? Uh, the environmental technology team who manages the EP certification process posted the iMac repair manuals this week with plans to release manuals for Macs and portable products in May or June and a desire to release an iPhone repair manual at some point. The team failed to receive any clearance across the various teams. Sandy Green thinks we should consider taking down the manuals. However, we think it's important to have a decision about what our strategy is and execute against that direction. We have one reporter inquiry from a freelancer who writes for iFixit and has had pieces run in the New York Times and Popular Science. So who the F is Sandy Green and why do you want these basic-ass manuals taken down? Sandy Green, what do you do? Who are you? What do you do? Sandy Green, Apple... Apple's product line manager. So you're, nah, yeah, note to self. Keep. The memo also asked the all important question are we comfortable releasing our repair manuals for our products moving forward? Apple, if you're listening, the answer is yes. Public service manuals are helpful for your customers. They're useful for recyclers, they save the planet by extending product lifespans, and they're just plain the right thing to do. Do you want people repairing your products safely? Then teach them how to do it the right way. Fast forward to the present, and these iMac manuals have now been online for a year. Has any harm come from it? Have lawsuits sprung out of the woodwork? Only Apple knows, but we certainly haven't heard of any. For our friends at Apple reading this, please find out and let Jaws and Phil know the results of your investigation. We don't need to know, but the future of the technology industry could depend on your answer. Repairing the planet. These revelations are timely, as Apple's newest environmental progress report went out of its way to talk about the importance of reuse and repair. This is where my blood pressure will go up, and uh, it's going to be difficult to continue reading the article, so please forgive me if I misspeak. We take responsibility not only for our direct operations, but for the entire life cycle of our products, the Apple report states. It's the first time we've seen Apple say reuse is our first choice, so bluntly, and they've got the prioritization spot on. They go on to say making repairs more convenient and reliable is directly aligned with our goal of creating long-lasting products that maximize the resources we use. This is precisely the correct stance for both customers and the environment. You, you don't. Can I buy a CD3217 to fix some of these 16-inch MacBooks that are sitting in the store that literally need one effing chip to make that $4,000 computer work again? Of course not. Of course not. Apple's report also takes a victory lap for the iPhone's serviceability track record. Despite some bumps along the way, they're correct that the iPhone has routinely led the pack on smartphone serviceability and longevity. When it comes to ease of repair, Samsung's Galaxy line isn't even in the same solar system. Apple's internal repair manual memo ends by asking, how should our public position on right to repair change to take into account the updates we're making? Should we connect the dots or try and keep everything separate? Implicit in that question is the cognitive dissonance that Apple team members must be feeling. In the minds of the public, the company's legislative opposition to common sense right to re uh, repair reforms is perceived as a desire for planned obsolescence, if not a compulsive need for control. But Apple is leading the industry with many green initiatives, and their environment team wants to move forward on reuse and repair. The entire company is justifiably proud of the industry-leading repairability of the iPhone. Why not connect the dots and drop the unpopular political fight? Apple could easily turn one of their biggest political liabilities into a win. And here's the part where I will steam. Their independent repair program already has all the elements required to comply with a right to repair law. I hope that's not the case. And if that is the case, then we seriously need to just literally scrap that part of the legislation because that bill sucks. So let's go over this independent repair provider program. Actually, I don't have to go, through, I don't have to go over it because I already did this in a video that I did a while ago. So I went over this program in detail and in these two videos and I would suggest that you check out these two videos that I did the first one is going to be is the Apple independent repair program any good the second one is going to be Apple's independent program is a useless PR stunt this one is a more useful video so in the video I go over numerous aspects of what makes this program complete garbage the first thing that makes it complete garbage is that it's limited right now to iPhone screens and batteries. You want the charge port? You want the earpiece? You want the microphone? You want any part for a MacBook? 
Do you want a schematic? Do you want a TriStar chip? Do you want an ISL 9240? Uh, Do you want an ISL 6259? Do you want a MacBook screen? Like that, the, the program is for iPhone screens and batteries. There's more to Apple products than screens and batteries. There are more product lines, but even within iPhones, there are many more things that we are looking for. We would like schematics so that we can work on the motherboards without having to go to Venafix or put a ch some dongle in my computer that connects to a Chinese server that you get from ZXW so that you have the ability to get a schematic. No, that's not what we're looking for. And even if you actually use that program, you need to take down the serial number of the phone, something like the serial, the IMEI of the phone, in order to order the battery. So right now, what I do is I order batteries from China, and, when I, and then I stock them, so that when a customer comes in and they want a screen or a battery, I can replace their battery as they wait, which is what they expect. If I tell a customer, hey, I need to take down the IMEI of your phone so that I can order a battery, wait three to five days for it to arrive, they're going to laugh in my face. No consumer expects a three to five day turnaround time for an iPhone battery. That's disgusting. That's garbage. That's trash. And if I send back the original, if I don't send back the original battery, it winds up costing an insane amount of money for the battery. So the prices in the program, the fact that it's limited to the parts that it's limited to is one thing. But the fact that it's put together in a manner where no customer will ever want me to use that program speaks volumes to the fact that, no, that is not what we are advocating for. And if right to repair, if that program puts them in line with right to repair legislation, then what that means is that the right to repair legislation that we have been advocating for this entire time is fucking useless garbage and needs to be rewritten from the ground up in order to be something that actually has teeth that matters. Because if this piece of shit program, the way that I went over it in this video, is something that actually would comply with right to repair legislation, if Kyle is indeed correct, and I am scared that there is a chance that he is correct in here, then th that's awful. That's genuinely, genuinely awful. And if Kyle can say that this program would comply with right to repair legislation, then imagine how easy it's going to be to convince a congressperson or a senator who can tell the difference between fucking Facebook and Twitter, as you could tell from two days ago, to say, yeah, you don't need this legislation. Look, we're, we already have a little program. It already complies with it. It's fine. And you, you know what the sad thing about this whole shit is? You know what the really fucking pathetic part about all of this crap is? The sad part is that when this program came out, I actually said out loud, congratulations, Apple, for doing a good thing. Apple helps independents buy parts. Before the details came out, before all the information on how the program works came out, I said congratulations for doing a good thing. And the thumbnail of my video said thank you in it. So if this garbage program, which I call it a garbage program five months later in this video when I actually learned how trash it is, is actually going to be a way of brushing repair legislation under the rug by them saying, look, see what we're already doing? We're already doing it. We don't need that. Oh, uh, it's going to be sad. Publishing the service manual isn't a hurdle. They've already done it. Service manual is different from board schematic. Get back to me when there's a board schematic. Get back to me when there's an ISL 9240 or a CD3217 for sale. That should be the benchmark. And I should set that right now. So that in the future, if I wind up becoming a corrupt human being uh, and trying to convince you that we've had success when we haven't, let me set the benchmark here on July 31st. If we're unable to purchase a CD3217 or an ISL9240 chip through legal means, whatever legislation, whatever progress I've made is bullshit. Apple has an opportunity to push, nay lead the entire industry in a better direction. Durable, repairable, long-lasting products could be the norm. iFixit has been the go-to support resource for Apple customers with hardware problems for the over 15 years. We've been forging our path alone, reverse engineering every single product, and writing repair procedures from scratch. We can keep working in isolation, but we'd all be better off if it was a collaboration. And aside, we never performed a repairability assessment of the spec bum 2019 iMac, but we will continue do so within a week's time. The public availability of these service manuals automatically increases its score by one full point. Those are my thoughts. I will read your comments. With any luck, they're good ones. Let's see what you all have to say. Why is he home? I am home because I don't feel like living on the street. And I'm lucky enough that I have led a life that does not require that I live on the street. Streaming from the street would be a pain in the ass. Are you going to hire lobbyists? You know, I think that if I'm capable of making a real push, that hiring lobbyists is not the way to go. What I should be doing is training people in their locales on how to be effective at lobbying for their own causes without hiring a lobbying firm. 
And one of the things that I've wanted to do is start a nonprofit trade association for the repair industry. That this is the project that I've been, I've always had, I've always had like in the back of my mind as a dream, you know, if money were available, which it seems like it actually will be soon. I've always wanted to start some sort of nonprofit that actually provides real repair training, real manuals, real support for actual, for businesses that shows here's how you repair devices, that funds people that provide education or free video training similar to what I provide, and all the other facets of the, of the industry that I don't cover, that offer support and resources, but that also helps train people on how to advocate, how to deal with their senators, their Congress people, how to, you know, ma make time to uh, actually advocate for themselves properly it, and it looks like that is a pro I actually got I actually got a text message in the middle of the stream about the creation of that 501c3 trade organization that I want to create saying that a check arrived so seems like this may actually be happening sometime soon so I am quite excited to see what it is that I would be able to do if I had actual money that is something we're going to find out and I have a lot of planning to do to ensure that I am able to do this properly I would, I would really like to encourage and provide resources for people in the industry that are really good at what they do that think it's a waste of my time to educate other people on how to do this. The hardest thing for me by far getting into this industry is figuring out everything myself. Kyle, I love you at I fix it. I really do. You're like a brother to me. So can you not take offense when I say this? Your guides don't tell me how to do profitable repairs. They tell me how to replace the display assembly instead of the LCD. They tell me, like, uh, I, I, when, when a new device comes out, if you actually want to fix it profitably in this industry, you're not going to a guide site. You're buying two or four of them, breaking the first two or three of them, and then on the fourth one, when you get it right, then you actually do it. Like with, um, with the MacBook Air screens. Like the first one that we open, we destroy. But then after that, we figure out how to replace this, you know, $65 or $80 cell instead of replacing a two or $400 LCD assembly. And the... There's a limit to the guides that are out there because once people figure out how to do that, they often don't want to share it with others. There are the outliers like me that are crazy enough to take that first step and, well, we'll figure out afterwards if we still have a business once we are done teaching everybody how to do what we do. But I'd like to be able to actually fund individuals who are good at this. And that's a plan that I've had. I've really wanted to follow through on for a really long time. And it looks like I'm going to be able to actually do that. And I'm very excited about that. And I'd like to be able to provide resources, advocacy from uh, for the same way that I have for the past seven years, but on a much larger scale now that I'm not just like rubbing two sticks together to do it. And I'm kind of excited about that. I... Why no work? There's money to be made. There's always money to be made. There's a lot of money to be made in the repair industry. And we do have a lot of work at the store. We are getting, there, there, is, there is stuff to be fixed at the store, actually. What mic do you use? This is an Audio-Technica 4050. I got this with a really big dent in it that I hammered out. And then I'd use the good old Ricky Began trick from Avatar Studios of uh, using the Sharpie marker on it to make it look like it's black again when it's actually just beat up shit. It sounds pretty good. I, I forget what I got this thing for. It was like 100 or 200, around uh, 100 to 200 dollar area about 13 years ago or so. What is on your shirt sleeve? This is either, I think this is a drop of oil from my bike from the chain or some shit from when I was uh, replacing disc brake pads. Why do you care? You're supposed to use a lighter, not a hammer to remove the battery. If they took it down, it would be bad PR. Bringing it to their attention, intention had to trigger that thought. Otherwise, I'm sure they would have just taken it down. Apple can always be relied on to do what's best for Apple first, its customers as a distant second, and its partners. Yeah, pretty much. I think we need more companies that will make the parts, whatever they may be, to make tiny changes to those parts, patent them, and proceed. This has been done for years with all products. Kind of curious how it would be to do that with, let's say, a CD3217. I believe it's Texas Instruments that makes that. Is it? Hopefully I'm not talking out of my ass there. But for, for instance, the CD3215. It's available. It's not like Texas Instruments will sell it to me, but someone's figured out how to find that damn chip and be able to sell it to me. CD3217, again... They've locked down the supply chain to the point where if I want to buy the chip that very, very often dies on the new MacBooks for charging, 
that I, I can't do that. Like if, and you know how this machine is designed, right? Where if, if one of the chips for one of your four charging ports die, all your four charging ports die. Uh, it, how hard would it be to make a, an alternative to that? Are iPhones actually easier or are they more common than Samsung? I thought like, they glue everything. If you want to replace the battery on an iPhone, I mean, it has that layer around, it has that little waterproof seal around the screen, but even when you consider the waterproof seal, it's still easier to crack open. And also you have to keep in mind that since the iPhone opens like this, you open it from the screen side, not from the back side. If you want to replace the screen, you're just taking off the screen. On a Samsung, if you want to replace the screen, it's like, it's, 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 it's more difficult. What if there's some sort of compromise, some middle ground between what Apple wants and what you want? What would that be? Any situation that's a win-win. Absolutely, we could have compromise. You know, let's say I want CD32 17s to be available on mouser.com. Apple says you need a business license and to show that you're a repair center and then you can buy it. Okay, it's not the best, but you know, it's, a, it's at least a compromise. We're not, d repair isn't dead. Uh, you know, we, we, there are compromises that could be worked out, but the compromises that I'm not willing to accept are for all of humanity, you cannot buy a CD3217. For all of humanity, no ISL 9240 for you. For all of humanity, no schematic. Like that I'm not going to accept. So there are certain compromises that you can accept and there are certain, certain things that you just cannot compromise on. You should sell out to the dark side and become a consultant for Apple. You know, I've actually done some videos that I think I privated since where I said what I would say if I were a lobbyist. So what I did is I played back what Charlie Brown or Lisa McCabe would have said to the garbage that they would tell the senators. And then I said, here's how I would reply to that question if I worked for Apple and I was getting their lobbying money. And I think that I would be far better as an anti-repair lobbyist than any of these people. Are, they're not even trying. They're really, really, really bad at it. They're very fundamentally awful at it. They suck. Uh, I think I would be a much better anti-repair lobbyist. I shouldn't say, maybe I shouldn't say that. The fact that right to repair is not passed, even in its pathetic, tooth, current, toothless form. Maybe they are doing the right thing. But I think that, but that, 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 at the very least, I should rephrase it to the arguments they give publicly are bad. I would do a better job at that part. Leave that whole part where they're probably paying off someone in the back room to, you know, to keep it from going through to the existing lobbyists. Nothing is going to change from within a company. Legislation is needed, whether that be Europe, where I'm at, or the U.S. Then and only will real steps be made. Maybe yes, yes or no. Yes or no. Because there are so many ways that you could get around legislation, especially the way this legislation is worded. Uh, I'm, just from the conversations that I'm seeing here, I already realize that this legislation needs a lot of editing in order for it to actually have any sort of teeth. We need to stop distinguishing in-house refurbishing versus... Up authorize repair center because one of the things is it says make the same things available to third party as you make to authorize repair but their authorized repair centers are not allowed to do anything so it's kind of useless having access to the exact same things that authorized repair has access to because they're useless please don't get suicided I'll work on it do you expect a right to repair a law to be passed when Congress people don't know the difference between Facebook and Twitter? Stop. Just stop. I listen to a lot of that. I listen to more of it than I have the blood pressure to. person with the unreadable name has gotten the wrong idea from this message. 
But I can't read your name, so I can't even respond to you. On Right to Repair, how can we convince major tech YouTubers to start talking about it more in product reviews? Only people I see talking about it is uh, me. There's probably other people talking about it. I, I stopped watching YouTube tech reviews a really long time ago. It just started, it, it, make, it makes me sick. Jerry Rig Everything is honestly the only one that I can even bother watching. The rest of it is like, look at the bezel, the bezel, the bezel, the camera, 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 the bezel, the camera. I don't care! The Fucking Basil. If, if there was anybody who was going to be willing to discuss this stuff, it would be Jerry Rig Everything, because he at least makes durability or the ability to fix something part of the content that he makes. Durability is a big part of it, and I really respect Jerry Rig Everything for bringing durability into the discussion of these product reviews. I like what he does. Probably him, if anybody. How he ended up in the world where cocaine is easier to buy than original replacement parts. Yeah, that's, uh, that is actually true. If I wanted cocaine, I could get cocaine right now easier than I could a CD3217. It's just crazy. You got to think about this. If we go back like 50 to 60 years ago, like 50 years ago, getting marijuana was hard, or at least more, there was a larger taboo placed on marijuana, but you could buy virtually any part to fix the devices that you owned and get manuals. 50 years later, getting marijuana is easy and states are starting to legalize it, but if you want to buy a, a chip to fix your phone, you can't do that. That is really funny. You are speaking to your Katie's. What? What's a Katie? You think any of these antitrust hearings will have any benefit and right to repair? No. They don't know the difference between Twitter and Facebook. Uh, they, they, I was listening to a lot of that and they would ask a question and then cut the person off because they weren't answering the question. And then they would then go on to answer the question in a completely bullshit way. And then they would thank them at the end of it. I don't see those hearings going anywhere. I don't think they have any teeth and I don't, I don't, I wasn't able to listen to the whole thing because I eventually rage quit. I'm sorry to admit, but I, I couldn't listen to the whole thing, but I have a feeling that right to repair was not even brought up in the whole thing. I haven't seen anybody bring up... Because the thing is, anytime even an article like this I Fix It one comes up, I wind up getting flooded with 500 emails the day that it comes out. If Right to Repair was ever mentioned in the course of that congressional hearing, I would have gotten a message. So the fact that I didn't get anything there, I imagine it wasn't even brought up. It doesn't matter how much the lobbyists suck. They are the middlemen that provide backhanders to the politicos. Yeah. Personality of brick wall <laughs> doing my advertising for me. As long as people who have zero clue about a particular topic are allowed to vote at the same level as experts in the matter, there will be issues. Yes. I agree with right to repair, but only if work is done correctly. Oh, do you think governments are making tech companies the boogeyman? There are so many legacy companies that are monopolies. ISP, coal, oil, etc. Coal is starting to kind of drift off. ISPs are monopolies. But they're monopolies that often were mandated by... Like if, you, if you take a look at how this was set up around 100, 90 to 100 years ago, in order to secure investment, people, I mean, in order to wire a town, people would go to the government and say, we'll wire the whole place, but we want a monopoly on this region. And rather than giving the middle finger and saying, no, F you, they figured, well, we're not going to get all this infrastructure built unless we make these agreements. Ah. And they were also worried about duplica duplicating infrastructure. So, like, F Facebook being a monopoly is not something that the government had a hand in, if that makes any sense. 
There was also that handshake agreement that you're going to wire the areas that are not really profitable to wire. In exchange, you get a local monopoly. But when it comes to, let's say, f you know, Facebook, or uh, it's not like Apple, I mean, it's not like the government had a great hand in that becoming a monopoly. I would understand why they would put less focus on monopolies that they kind of had a hand in creating to begin with. I agree with rights repair, but only if the work is done correctly. I disagree. People are already doing work incorrectly. People are doing work incorrectly across the board. Do you think everybody that was buying parts from Radio Shack to fix devices in their home is going to do the work correctly? Do you think everybody that goes to Home Depot and buys power tools is going to do work correctly? Eugene went to Home Depot and bought power tools that he utilized to build me a fucking deck. And he had the right to buy all that stuff. Don't get it twisted. I think that we should have all the materials available to train people and also to I think that we need as a, to as an industry have some sort of body some sort of leadership that tries to craft standards and live up to those standards and encourage those standards that's universally respected not something that's just like we registered a domain name so that sounds like repair so listen to us but that's gonna but even without that People do have the, uh, the, the right to. I guess th there's also the question of right versus ability. I'm behind chat about seven minutes. Continue. Does he read Twitch comments? Never. They're awful. They're awful. Awful. Of course I do. Can you demonstrate live to Congress how board fixes work? Yeah. I, I, well, yes and no. So when I went and visited some senators in 2015, I actually took a board with me. I took a logic board with me that had a wire on it, and I it was I still remember where the wire is from. It was from the it was for the TON resistor on the PP342 underscore G3 hot circuit on 820-2936. Ah, I remember all my board repairs, like literally every single one, right up here. I can't remember anything else, but I remember all this stuff, and I showed them that. This wire is why th this this had a little corrosion over here at Apple. The customer was quoted 750. Now my business charges, uh, I think at the time it was between 250 to 325 for it. Other places charge 400. Uh, people on eBay charge 90 bucks. People in the middle of nowhere, where cost of living are not the bullshit that we pay in New York, and the guy got a chuckle when I said that, charge 100 to 150. But the market will set this repair between 80 to 400 and a few days, whereas Apple says 750 and several weeks, and oftentimes will erase your data. And this is all that was necessary to do it. And this is the knowledge. So I have. And the thing is, when I do that, I have an instant sign-on. When we went to Nashville, Tennessee in 2017, Jessa actually wanted to replace a battery, I think, in someone's phone, and she was told she couldn't because that could be considered bribery. You know, like you're performing a service that would otherwise cost money for the politician. When Kim Roback gives a senator in Nebraska thirty-two to $3,800 several days before a right to repair hearing on behalf of AT&T, who she's a registered lobbyist for, that's considered lobbying. But if Jessa wants to take a battery she bought for $5 and showcase how to replace a battery in someone's phone who has a broken phone, that's bribery. Jerry Rig is good. I agree. I like Jerry Rig. I want to have the ability and access to parts, but sometimes I want to Eugene my pull-up bar for myself only. <laughs> yeah. We already... Uh, that's the thing. With other devices, people have the right to Eugene their things, and they do. It's not the best argument to make, obviously, but...
All right. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.